Um, our, our next speaker will, will actually be speaking you know, again about Game 3 and the Homeland Security Enterprise. And uh, um, that's Dr. June. Z yeah, fine. Okay, I'm going I'm to say Dr. J, right? I'm not a basketball player. I'm not there. Uh, that because I'm, I'm messing up the name really bad. But he'll come back and speak to you uh, uh, a little bit about some of his work, some of the things that are of interest. Hopefully you'll find those as of interest as, as well. And uh, what I ask is the, uh, the interaction, the dialogue with, with the first speaker was really good on that. Uh, do that. You know, ask the questions. You should get a benefit out of this. Even during the presentation, you can say, I got a question. I, 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 um, I ask the questions because I want you to walk away thinking, I learned something different. Or at least I opened up uh, um, mentally. I'm, I'm thinking of a concept I would never have considered before. And, that, and, and the beauty of all, all this is, you know, when you get back to your your your, your uh, assigned areas, your, your stations, regional commands, things of that nature, you can go back on our website, on that, and look at that. This stuff's recorded. The agendas are on there. The powerpoints are on there. Uh, the different different sections. But more importantly, it's going to have all their contact information. So down the road, he goes, you know, I got a question, or a question for Dr. Kim. Kim. Uh, and, uh, you'd send that. And uh, all three of them have actually have encouraged that. Because uh, the, 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 their interaction with you is also really valuable. And, and quite honestly, I think it's more valuable for them than it is for you to them on the deal. Because they're listening to some of the uh, uh, perspectives. And what they want, again, they, they want their research to actually have a practical value on that. So, sir? And, and, and you should be all set. Okay. okay. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you. So my name is Jun Zhuang, and some people call me Jun, some people call me Zhang, some, some people call me Jun. Uh, the authentic way to that is Jun, but I think that I recognize uh, either way that they call me. And so today I'm going to talk about a little bit about the game theory and homeland security research that I've been doing the past uh, like maybe 10 or 12 years. And I did not list all my collaborators here. There are many, many of my collaborators here, but I did uh, list uh, my sponsors here. It has been sponsored by National Science Foundation, DHS, Air Force, uh, Department of Energy, and uh, uh, also through the Crate Center and the Star Center that Victor just mentioned. Uh, and let's see if that works. OK, perfect. So overall, research framework, I've been working on game theory for many, many years and published a couple of papers. And so I put all the journal, uh, the article titles into this uh, word cloud, and we find out the game is really the keyword. And of course, they also talk about lots of uh, terrorism, the defense, and homeland security, resource allocation, mathematical modeling. And if you're interested in reading academic papers, they're all downloadable from my uh, web page, uh, from this page. And so let's talk about lots of, uh, uh, it's, it's lots of games. But if, when we talk about games, we need to talk about who are the players. And for this, uh, uh, and this game is dealing with the disasters and uh, homeland security. So by talking about the disasters, we basically uh, classify disasters into two types. One is uh, adaptive disasters, uh, such as terrorism or cyber, uh, cyber threats on the right side. Oh, the other one is like natural disasters, like earthquakes or tornadoes or snowstorms when people are coming from Buffalo. And then they are not <coughs> non-adaptive uh, threats. Uh, and the difference between this is uh, suppose like we build the New Orleans uh, like a dam very, very strong, like Hurricane uh, Katrina would still hit there. It would not result to uh, our puzzle here. Right? And then, uh, but if we like different New York City very, very well, then the terrorists maybe switch a target very easily to Boston or Chicago. So in that sense, like the terrorists could be very strategic, could be very adaptive. And how to take that into the consideration when we allocate the limited resources, so that's a key uh, a key idea of this game theory application for the homeland security. And when we talk about the players, the multiple players in this uh, uh, in this uh, context, we first of all we have lots of people from the government uh, sectors. I believe that uh, many, if not most, of the uh, colleagues here we are from the government sectors uh, in this room. And uh, for government, we have federal government, we have local government, we have state governments, and of course sometimes we also deal with the foreign governments, especially uh, dealing with uh, lots of uh, like treaties and uh, other uh, inter-government uh, collaborations. And then we have uh, the private sectors. We have the private corporations, we have the NGOs, and we have private citizens uh, like you and uh, me. We also, like different players, they have different payoffs, they have different uh, strategies, they have different uh, objectives. And the question is how to 
get along with each other and how to like align your interests together in this uh, homeland security and the disaster man uh, management context. And so like different governments have different uh, uh, options they can do. They can send the patrols. They can uh, like invest uh, some of the countermeasures, and they can send the UAVs, or or then oh they can put like more sensors. So as uh, they have grants, then they collect taxes, and then uh, they also like provide like foreign aids or foreign subsidies like between governments. And all those like resources allocations they have some purposes, and maybe they need uh, some other parties to give back or pay back somehow. And then from the private corporations and private sector's perspective, they're the same. They also have their own missions. They are, most of them, they are for profits, uh, but they also have like the social responsibilities. And then they can uh, they pay the tax, but they also need to do their private investment by themselves. Like actually, I read a report uh, like from the DHS, like 80% of the national critical infrastructures are owned by private sectors. They are not owned by federal governments. Now, how to how to protect like 80% of the critical infrastructures very well, considering that they are actually owned by private sectors. And so that's actually a pretty interesting and important critical public-private partnerships problems, and how to make a win-win situation rather than rather than a, like a, a tense and a tensions between between each other. So that's how the game theory could provide a framework so that we can think about that. How to first of all how to deal with adaptive adversaries, and second of all how to uh, develop a win-win public-private partnerships between the different sectors of the from the defenders' uh, side. And of course, uh, when we talk about different actions there, in general, we can classify the actions into the pre-event uh, action, like the pre-event prevention, the preparation. And also, we can talk about the post-event, like relief and investigation. And sometimes, uh, it's very tricky to do this balance. And uh, I, I think uh, from the uh, I think that most of the cases, the post-event reliefs, it's got lots of uh, like media uh, like attractions. Uh, the budget is relatively easy to, to spend to, to justify, but actually it's very co not that cost effectiveness. Uh, so there's some research uh, suggested that every one every one dollar spent like uh, before the event happens is actually it's worthy like four dollars or maybe ten dollars of the event that happens. So, however. If you before the event happens, you do not know where the terrorists would attack and where the like illegal immigrants would enter, and you don't know the location, you don't know the magnitude, and how could you allocate the resources with this uncertainty? So that's a key challenge. But uh, in order to do some mathematical modeling and to use some of the data and try to do some quantitative analysis, that would be provide some helpful decision support tools for this uh, type of uh, problems. And and what is game theory? Uh, the first speaker already talked about the game theory. And uh, so basically, this is a branch of applied mathematics. And I don't know how many of you like math math mathematics in this room. How many of you hate mathematics? Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't have to raise your hand, especially in front of your colleagues. But, uh, but, but mathematics is not that. Uh, it could be fun, it could be, uh, but it could be boring also. Uh, and, but it's a game series that basically is a branch of applied mathematics, but it considers how to mathematically uh, capture the behavior in the strategic situation. And especially the individual's success not only depends on what them do, but also it depends on what other people do. Okay. In order for me or for the decision maker to be successful, we not only depends on what I do, but also depends on what other people do. So that is a key concept in the game theory, especially in the homeland security uh, uh, area. That it's whether you're going to be successful or not. Not only depends on what you do, but also depends on how the adversaries and how the other uh, partners uh, respond to what you do. So that's we we want to keep that into the consideration of when we make any of the important decisions. So I believe uh, game theory has been applied to many many different areas, uh, like in biology and population evolution. People talk about using game theory to study how some of the certain uh, populations and uh, species evolves and why some certain species like uh, dies. And in the transportation, I know I just had a nice conversation with one of the colleagues saying that uh, in this area there uh, either going to be congestion or going to be nothing. Uh, uh, so, but then transportation, why the congestion could happen, right? The congestion, the road is the same, but the congestion happens only if there's multiple 
transport, uh, multiple travelers choose the same route at the same time, and then the congestion happens. So game theory actually has been used to study the, the traveler's equilibrium, talk about the, if you have multiple way of choices, the how to optimally like choose the, choose the route so that you are, you're better off not to be caught into the, uh, into the uh, congestion in the traffic. And actually, the technology could provide one of the tools, like the, some of the uh, real, like, uh, GP, real time GPS uh, uh, could, uh, could provide the support, like the Google Map could provide the support, so that every time you do uh, look at the map, see that whether it's red or it's green, so that you can try to avoid. But you know what? That if every people try to reroute, maybe the way that you're rerouting could become congested. So it becomes the equilibrium uh, thing. So how to uh, how to do an equilibrium solution so that uh, every people are kind of uh, balanced out. Now computer networks. Now lots of my, lots of people. Many, actually, most of the people using computers uh, nowadays. But the computer network itself is a games. Not only between the games between the hackers and yourself, but also between you and uh, your colleagues. For example, like at universities, universities provide free download of antivirus software. Right? And, but why is that? Is that really because the uh, university cares about the individual computers? Uh, maybe or maybe not. But actually, uh, in order, if you do not actually ask this to my students, if the university do not provide that for free, nobody wants to spend like five more dollars to purchase that. And if people, if nobody spend five dollars, not to mention it's actually fifty dollars, not like one hundred dollars. But if people do not willing to pay like five dollars or twenty dollars on the antivirus software, then your computer itself could turn into a hub sending the virus to many other people in the same network. So it becomes, uh, uh, becomes uh, it's a game between the defenders facing the hackers uh, uh, threat. Like cybersecurity actually becomes a very more and more important threat in this, uh, uh, in this uh, area. And, but the hackers, they are also very adaptive. The, hack, the hacking cost is almost zero. And they can, but they can very, like, they can also choose like, different targets if you already like very defended like a uh, target, well, I mean the target cooperation, uh, then you can, maybe they can easily uh, switch to other targets. And then, and, and then how to take that into the consideration when we do the, uh, do the problems. And then last year I did a project with the DHS talk about the cybersecurity information sharing projects. That suppose you have like a vulnerabilities uh, for your own organization. Do you want to share this information to the, uh, to the government? Or do you want to share this information to your, your peer uh, corporations? And why? There's a pros and cons of doing, of doing that. And from the government's perspective, how to regulate, how to uh, provide subsidies so that uh, people are, uh, like could be safely and uh, are burden free to share information with each other. Now, political science, we saw the elections, there are lots of uh, games going on uh, like in the past uh, one month. We don't want to say too much about that uh, anymore. The health care itself, itself also is a game, right? The health care systems, there are lots of players here. Let's talk about that here. Talk about uh, like the insurance companies, the hospitals, the nurses, the medical doctors. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies, the patients, and the, the, they are all the different uh, groups of the, the. And then, basically, if you want to save some of the costs, basically you're cutting other people's jobs. And then, so what is the trade-offs and how to create a win-win situation in this whole system? Like game theory has already been applied, like gradually into that area as well. Like business and supply chains, there are lots of uh, uh, supply chains uh, players, like the, including the producers, the manufacturers, the, the shippers. <coughs> And also the retailers and the consumers. So game theory has been starting there too, like. But actually, uh, the I re the re the real reason that why why I studied game theory a lot in my academic uh, life is because I really enjoyed the personal thinkings of game theory. I just uh, I just cannot stop uh, thinking that way. So I have a uh, one wife and I have three kids and I have a uh, department chairs and I have my like uh, six PhD students and many other like master students, undergraduate students. Every time I saw them, I say, oh, okay, what, what, how to think like from a game's perspective that what I do not only what I uh, how I win would not only depend on what I do but also depend on what they do. But in order for them to do what I want them to do, I need to probably provide some incentives. I probably I want to keep their interest in mind, and then so actually that uh, becomes a uh, 
becomes like personal thinking of philosophy. That's when you when you dis, when you make your own decision makers try to think about who are the stakeholders, what's their decision making process, and how to put that into the framework when you make your own decisions. So that's really uh, like the game theory uh, thinkings and methodology. I think I suppose we can skip that slide for this uh, for this room. But basically, game theory could be applied could be merged with, with network science so that we can do the games with the networks. And we can, uh, game theory could be applied uh, with dynamic programming so we can do dynamic games with, uh, uh, can be married with uh, like robust optimization so we can do like a robust uh, game theory. We can study like a behavior games uh, when we uh, study the behavior science with the game theory. So game theory itself is really not uh, like a standalone uh, like branch of science, it's actually it could be easily to be merged or integrated with many many other dif disciplines, so that we can uh, deal with like more realistic and more uh, interesting uh, scenarios. And the key components of the game, and I believe that in your one of your like post the test uh, like a uh, uh, questionnaire, so you can you can uh, check the box there. And so the the key components of the games. First, we need to talk about who are the players. Okay, the players uh, they basically are decision makers. If there's a stakeholders who are impacted by your decision, but they are not making any of the decision, then they are not players. Okay, they are not players in the game theory context. However, if they do make some decisions, even like including protest or including like a, uh, an other type of uh, like personal investment, then they are basically the, uh, the players. For each of the players, we need to talk about what is their options, then what they do, okay, what's their alternatives, what they could do. And then, uh, and then this also sometimes called moves. And then we talk about sequence of moves. Sequence of moves, basically, it could be who moves first, who moves the second, are they move simultaneously. So um, simultaneously basically means uh, they are moving, it does not have to be moving exactly at the same time. As long as when I make my decisions, the other players do not know what my decision uh, is when they make their own decisions, that is considered as a simultaneous uh, moves. And then we can talk about what is objectives, what is the payoffs, and how this object and the payoffs not only depends on their own decisions, but also depends on what other people's uh, decisions. And then what is the information structure there? Do people have a complete information? So in game theory, we typically we assume a complete information is the first step, but then we can uh, easily could be like argued that it's not really true that some adversaries may have incomplete information, uh, or you may have incomplete information about the adversary, and the adversary may be having incomplete information about yourself, and then how to model the incomplete information, uh, information asymmetry, and then uh, study the value of information, and study the value of intelligence, a study that's what's, how, what you do, do to, in order to make the decisions with incomplete information. What is the timing? What is the time? Is this a repeated game, or is that it's a, a like a single shot game? And is there any of the ending point? And sometimes uh, one of the mistakes that people could make is uh, we assume that each game is just a one-time shot. That actually is a, the solution, equilibrium solution, could easily change if it's a dynamic game. And we're going to talk more uh, very shortly. Equilibrium. Equilibrium is a solution concept for game theory. <clears throat> it's a basically talk about the, at some point, Nash equilibrium is basically at some point that nobody is uh, better off by switching or deviating from that strategy, from that solution without other people deviating. Okay. So that we can reach at the, uh, the stable point so from all the uh, parts. And then some of the insights from some simple attacker defender games is if you look at uh, the diagrams on the left side, uh, it's uh, the attack effort could actually, the x-axis is a defense investment. It actually could first increase and decrease in, in the defense investment. Uh, so first of all, if the de defense investment is zero or is just very, very low, then the attacker does not need to spend too much effort in order to be successful. Okay? But if the defense investment is infinity, where well, hypothetically infinity, there is no way that the attacker could win. So that the attacker uh, would be deterred in that sense. But in the between, sometimes we, we uh, theoretically we've proved that the attack effort could first increase and decrease. And why? Because if you do spend a little bit of defense in order for the attacker to be successful, the attack want to spend more in order to like uh, uh, to get more advantage in this game, so that 
the attack effort could increase. So that part actually could be ignored in practice. That uh, this could be counterintuitive. That's when you spend some of the defense there. Why the why they like fight back, right? They, why they uh, they like they spend more efforts from the adversary side, and then. So this is something called the best response. The first speaker mentions so attack effort as a function, best response function as a defense effort. And then if we put the attacker's best response and attack, a defender's best response together, we can get some of the uh, re some point called the Nash equilibrium point. And so this uh, red one is actually one of the one of the potential attacker best response. And so the blue one is a defender's best response. If we put them together, the, the circle here would be the Nash equilibrium point. So at this point, the defense investment is about 1.3, uh, and attack efforts investment is a point, a point 0.1. So this is about the simultaneous game, uh, uh, Nash equilibrium in this particular example. However, we also studied the sequential game. So sequential game, the difference between sequential game is that in the sequential game, the defender move first by, by like, uh, by like disclose what their strategies. Some of the dis uh, disclosures is a, uh, is voluntary. Some of the disclosures are mandatory by the government regulations. Some of the disclosures are unavoidable. Like if you like uh, put a, like a fence there or like a wall there, then there's no way that people cannot observe that. And then by doing that, you're basically playing a sequential game because the uh, adversary sees there's a fence or there's a barriers or walls there, and then they're going to make a, a best response to that. And then, then in that case, we are going to play a sequential game. So in that sequential game, we can uh, we can still consider what is attacker's uh, effort there, and then we can see that for each combinations of the attacker effort and the defense investment, what is the defender's uh, uh, utility, so what is the defender's payoffs, and then we can draw the best response, uh, the indifference curves for the defender, uh, which is uh, the lower, the better for the defender, and then we can find the intersections between these uh, indifference curves and the best response curves, that would be the equilibrium solutions for the defense investment, which is a green star. And we see that the green star is better than this uh, circle uh, in terms of have higher defender payoffs, but this green uh, star would uh, would uh, include like higher like defense investments. However, the attack effort is deterred. Okay, and then of course you can spend more money for the defender side, but spending more money is not may not be justified. You may uh, by spending more not more money for the defender side, it may be waste of uh, money because uh, the attacker is already being deterred. So the question is, what is the optimal level of defense in order to uh, deter the the attacker? And then, when we, so the one of the insights from the, from the previous page, actually we proved mathematically, is uh, in the games of complete information, the uh, defender always want to disclose, one always want to play the sequential game, the stack work game. And then that means what? That means whatever that the defense is, we want to, we want to disclose that to the public, and we want to disclose that to the, uh, to the adversaries. And then this may not be always true, in, especially in this like a homeland security context. Sometimes we want to put something like a secret, or sometimes we want to put something like even we put some sort of deception uh, there, like a dec uh, decoys. And then, uh, so and then we published a couple of papers, and it's basically the insight of the papers is if the games with no private defender information, okay, in other words, that the attacker, that adversary knows everything about the defender then there's a truthful disclosure is always preferred to secrecy and deception, as long as the cost of truthful disclosure is, uh, uh, is, is uh, relatively low. However, in the games of the private defender information, uh, that means the adversary is uncertain about the defender's valuation, uh, about defender's uh, some private information, then secrecy and deception actually could be strictly preferred by the defender at the equilibrium in order to mimic the other types of defender. Even the cost of such secrecy and deception is uh, not that uh, trivial. And some examples. And uh, so some people, when they, at 5 PM, they got off the walk and they look at his car. This car looks like a crappy car. It's a kind of a, how many of you would like to 
drive this car. Huh? Probably, I, I think I drive this car when I first come to US when I was a graduate student. Uh, and so I think I pay like uh, $800 or something like that uh, for this car. But actually, this is a, not a crappy car. It's, it's actually a brand new car. Huh? It's just with like crappy car covers. Yeah. And if the car cover is uh, made in China, probably it's only $20 that you can get that from uh, some of the markets. And then, but why this happens? OK, this is a deception, right? It is a deception. And the deception happens because the car theft maybe have some incomplete information about the valuations of this defender, of this uh, car owners, right? As long as he has some of the uh, incomplete information, he may not choose to like, attack this car, right? And he may attack the other car, the neighbor car, which actually created some of the problems like games between the defenders, which we are going to talk about uh, in the next uh, uh, later. But, but as long as the, the attacker, the adversary, has some incomplete information about the, some valuations of the defender, the defender has some maybe want to choose, spend more dollars, spend some of the like, non-zero cost, like $20 or $100, to get this cover in order to mimic the other types of the defender, which has low valuation in order to deter the adversaries. And we probably see this in many, many in our areas. And uh, like security notice, this area is under 24 hours live recorded video souvenirs. How many of you see this sign? Probably some of you see this sign every day, right? The, and, but I got this sign like $3 at eBay. And I can, I can probably also can print that uh, for free through my like, uh, uh, color printer from my office. This is just a $3 at eBay. You can, every people can buy this sign just to put it on your property. And probably it can be as effective as uh, the true, like real, like the video surveillance system, which costs like $1,000 or $500. And then, but as long as the adversary has some incomplete information about uh, the, the defense, about the valuations, about <laughs> the technology, even about the cost of functions, and then maybe this could be a cost-effective way to do some of the randomized defense or random, using some of the deceptions. Uh, and then like security cameras, I think it's not, not everywhere. And, but actually, when I first uh, uh, see the uh, security cameras, I always think, about, hmm, how many of them are working? <laughs> and how many of them are real? And uh, well, I guess probably most of them are real, uh, most of them are working. But as long as they are there, they actually they, they provide some of the deterrence effects. And, uh, but even it's possible that maybe 20% of them are not working, they are just a, a fake cameras there, but they, they could still be as effective as uh, the real cameras. Like speed checked by radar, and sometimes we see the speed checked by helicopters or by aircraft and the, uh, uh, everywhere. But every time that I saw this sign, I slowed down because I was almost uh, uh, likely to be uh, speeding. Uh, uh, but but how, do, how do you know that this radar is over, really over there? And how do you know that even the radar is there, the radar is able to tell which car is which? And, but as long as the radar, is, uh, as long as the people have these signs, people actually could slow down, could people uh, could be better off for everyone or for the society. And this could be kind of a deception. Uh, and like the Honeypot, Honeypot project, we also have a, uh, we did a like, sub-project for the cybersecurity project with DHS on this Honeypot. So Honeypot is a project, the basic idea is to try to create a false target and try to attract the, the bad guy. So that's the, the bad guy, the hacker, try to hack the false targets and then you can catch them. This is a deception, but it works. And it works uh, like the phishing from, I think there's some phishing operations from some of the law enforcement uh, uh, agencies. They also could work, but as long as the, the bad guy's adversary has some incomplete information about uh, yourself. Mm -hmm. But the bad guys, remember, the bad guys' attackers they could also be adaptive, right? They could also learn. They are not that's just uh, uh, like ignore uh, all this uh, uh, Information like so, we studied the scenarios where the attackers they have uh, incomplete information about the vulner the system vulnerability. Okay, whether the system the defense system is really vulnerable or not vulnerable, the, the attackers may not know that. The, in a, in a, uh, so lots of literature study that the attackers just either to attack or not attack. But in reality, the attackers they could spend some efforts to learn the system, right? To learn the system before they uh, choose to whether to attack or not attack. And then, 
uh, then by learning that they could get a signal, the signal is saying that, oh, the system is vulnerable, but the system could be vulnerable given the system is vulnerable, the system could also be invulnerable given the signal is still vulnerable. So there's like a, a false uh, uh, negative and like two types of errors uh, when we uh, interpreting the signals there. And then, so we study the cost of the learnings of the attackers and how the defenders could uh, model, could consider the learning process of the attacker into the defense uh, uh, resource allocation process. And it's only not, not just like one period of things. It could be uh, repeated, repeated uh, many, many, many times. So every time that we talk about, okay, we want to deter the adversaries, but deter to where? When the when the adversary is deterred, are they just uh, simply switch target? Or are they just uh, like uh, deferred to next year? Are they accumulating resources so they can like uh, have a, like more and a, a bad, like a bigger attacks? We, we don't know. And sometimes we probably we can, uh, uh, it's very difficult to justify the, like the value of deterrence because deterrence could simply mean that they are switching Targets. So I presented this at the TSA uh, like a couple of years ago. The TSA, you know, that like before like 911 attacks, that every people can like easily go to the airport security screen is nothing like compared to nowadays. But then they have like a shoe bomb, so that people have to like take off the shoes. Then they have like a liquid bomb, so they cannot like bring your liquids. And then you have like a I don't know underwear bomb, so that they can I don't know what's going on there. And then <laughs> then they're like. The adversaries are basically they're adapting, right? They're adapting lots of their like strategies and uh, based on whatever technology. I, I don't believe technology can really solve the problem. Uh, I think that technology could solve like maybe could solve the part of the problem, but it's what's the bigger pictures? Like uh, if the adversary could easily get around the technology and then lots of investment on the technology actually could become like worthless and it could be just a waste of the lots of the resources. And at least we need to, from a high level, it doesn't mean that we do not like technology. We definitely want to use the technology, but we want to use technology a smart way, so in a, a strategic way. And so this is a, a project that done actually through the uh, START uh, Center at, at University of Maryland, which I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, how to model the portable pathways for human tra uh, smuggling and trafficking uh, along the US-Mexico borders. So this is a project we uh, focus on uh, how to uh, model all the potential like the pathways, not only uh, not the port of entries, but also between the port of entries. And then we study, okay, there's a lot of, uh, consider a lot of terrain information, what is, uh, how, po how possible the, the pathways are and uh, are not. And then we actually, we build a very, uh, very complex, complex, like the off-road transportation networks. And then we build a, a, like a decision support tools. And then so that, uh, with the defenders uh, the, uh, could just uh, switch, like select the areas, and then the, and then uh, we to see that where to put the sensors and where to put the, the patrolling uh, strategies, and then from the bad guys, we assume the bad guys would uh, do the, the second move best response, so that it can choose the the optimal ways to get around out of the uh, the sensors, and then. Considering the potential best response of adversaries, how to uh, do the first uh, stage uh, deployment of the uh, of the uh, investment, and then so actually uh, now we have a new president and who may build a, a war, a great war uh, in in the uh, southern borders, and in the next couple of uh, years or maybe from the first months, I, we, we don't know that, and then. Actually, the, the, the war project or the fence project itself is, could be a very interesting research project from the academic side, but it also could be a very practical and uh, problems. I think probably a couple of, many of you in this room probably would be thinking about that uh, project. And where to build the wall, and uh, where to build the fence, and what type of fence, and the, that's like uh, like 10 feet or 20 feet high, or that's a concrete, or that's a, there are different, many, many different options. But then, but then the, from today's uh, lecture, want to people to think about that from the adversary's perspective, what the adversary could do? Are they able to game the fence? Right? Are they able to game the wall? Like suppose you build the uh, build the fence or build the wall, are they able to like easily dig a tunnel and then just to go through? Or how difficult is they are? And then if it's like a tw two thousand uh, miles uh, long, then what is the 
best sequence. That's uh, supposed to have limited budgets. What type of uh, how to allocate the budget optimally so that you can so that you can uh, like maximize the the total total security. We know that there's no way to have 100% security, right? So, and we know that people can the adversaries uh, uh, like advers like adaptive adversaries can always try to find ways to to go through. But the problem is what how to minimize the risk and how to maximize the, the security, considering that they could be smart, they could be adaptive, and what. But from their perspective, from the adversary's perspective, there must be some cost of doing that, right? There's some cost of to dig the tunnels. There's some cost there. There's a cost to build this. I don't know. This, this looks a little bit funny. Uh, and then, but, but then from the defender's perspective, what, what is the optimal way to do that? So we did some analysis uh, using some of the data, the so publicly available data, about the like, southwest border apprehensions uh, over the, in the past like 20 years, and then also the total fence lens. Actually, we found very interesting. They have like a very negatively correlated. Uh, probably some people in this room could give a better explanation than I could do. But at, at least from the data, we see that the seems that the fence is working. That's uh, the, the longer the fence, the, the, the like the, uh, smaller number of people that we we we, we would like to uh, apprehend, and maybe they can improve the, the other ways that uh, maybe we're not. Uh, well, the the good way to uh, explain this is we we have lots of deterrence, right? So we already like deter lots of uh, illegal immigrants, um, and we if we do this regressional analysis, actually we find that we explain like 92 percent of all the. Uh, other variants, and actually it's a fit pretty well in terms of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this data. And then we can do, then people talk about, okay, this may be related to the US uh, unemployment rate, and uh, potentially because uh, lots of illegal immigrants come here to try to get some jobs here. And then we find that yes, it is uh, actually it's pretty correlated as well. So if the unemployment rate increase, the actual apprehensions also decrease. So that means uh, this has also have some like deterrence effects. If the job situation here is bad, then actually uh, the le less people would come to the U.S. And so then actually the border fences around the world, we, we have uh, like 65 countries uh, uh, in this world, they actually we have uh, different types of offenses around the world. They say, so this is not really a crazy idea, but I think they are going to be built. Number six is, uh, is ours. And uh, so then the question, but the question is how and where and uh, what what is the sequence of doing that? What is the timing of uh, of doing that? So this actually this is me. Uh, it's uh, a couple of months ago in the Great War in China, and uh, I don't know whether the, the war would be look like this or not. Uh, and but the, if we want to do some research project, actually I would see that what is uh, like population density of Mexico and what why we want to study population density because. If you want to study the, the location of the wars and what is a, what type of wars to build, you, want, you may want to think about from the uh, who you are trying to prevent, who you are trying to deter, and this may be deter. It maybe it's correlated with the density. It's because everything is about travel costs, right? So right now I think like uh, only uh, like half or maybe less than half of the borders they have some type of offense. But why? Why? Uh, why is this a half, and why this is a lots of the rural areas? Uh, there's no fence because the rural areas is also like lots of desert areas, and people may not be able to travel that far, that for more than five hours in desert areas, and then so this all everything comes up, uh, come eventually come down with uh, what is the travel cost and what is uh, what is the response time that we need from the border patrol agencies here, and then what is the travel cost from the adversary, and what is the travel cost from the border patrols. And then the, what is the population density, so how we consider that, and also terrain information into uh, this uh, uh, interesting project. I think that would be some project that I'm interested in. I'm, that I'm very interested to collaborate with people in this room. And I think technically I'm, uh, we are around the launch time, and I don't know that what this timing is. Uh, and I can, it's, it's good to, Five more minutes, 10 more minutes? Five. Don't, don't worry? OK. <laughs> OK, I, I know uh, people could be hungry. Yeah. So let's uh, do 10 minutes, and let me finish this. And then another 
uh, considerations that I have been doing lots of uh, game, uh, game theory applications is uh, people talk about equity. Okay, talk about equity. What is fairness? What is equity in the homeland security? And so originally we studied a project with the uh, urban area security initiatives for the DHS projects. The originally they talk about like each of the states they're going to receive like 0.75 percent of the federal budget, regardless of what threats that they are facing. And then that turns out to be like 40 percent of the total budget that has already been allocated without any of the uh, risk-based uh, allocation. So for the because we have 50 states, and then. Then the question is how people are going to spend the money. Like the, for some of the states in New York and uh, California, I think that each of the people uh, receive like uh, $5 per capita uh, investment for that. But for states like Wyoming, they receive like $40 per capita. And then uh, there's some, maybe some national news that some of the uh, like Wyoming uh, police officers, they buy like a luxury uh, cars or, or like uh, SUVs, and then they have some like the national debates uh, about that. And then it turns out that uh, after 2008, then they just uh, cut down to half. Like rather than 0.75, it becomes like 0.375. Okay. Then the question is why is a half? Then uh, so we motivated by that examples. We see that huh, we do not tell people that war how much. Uh, resources are reserved for equity considerations, but we see that what is the cost of equity? Because we know that when we're dealing with uh, adaptive adversaries, uh, we, we understand that from the like, senator's perspective, from the Congress perspective, they talk about equities, but from the adversary's perspective, adversaries may not care about equity, right? They may, oh, we already like attack New York City, so we should attack Buffalo. No, they do not think that way. Uh, so then what is the cost of equity? So we find that the cost of equity actually is to increase convexly, so that means increasing uh, speed, uh, well, in terms of the equity coefficients. And then, so in this particular example, we see that we have 10 uh, targets. If the equity coefficient is one, then each of the targets get a 10%. But if the equity coefficient is uh, uh, less than one, then we are going to have the risk-based uh, 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 resource allocations. Of course, the lambda is a technology uh, coefficient. So the, when the technology becomes more and more advanced, then actually we can equity the cost. Actually, they get uh, lower and lower, which is uh, which is good. Another, I know that today we are going to talk about the game theory, but uh, we have lots of uh, debates and a lot of criticism about the game theory in this area. <laughs> People are always talking about. What if the adversaries are not playing the games with you? What if they are not strategic in the game theory sense? Okay, how to respond to that? So originally, I was trying to be defensive. I say, ah, well, if they are rational, if they really want to achieve their goal, they should play a game, and it's a worst case scenario. Blah 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 blah. But eventually, I say, okay, no, no, forget about it. Just the thing that, okay, I acknowledge that the adversaries may not play a game with you. Okay, they may not use game theory. So. Uh, then we see that, okay, they, they are being strategic, they play a game with probability Q, and they are not strategic with probability 1 minus Q. Okay? But if they're not playing the game with you, you have to tell us what they are going to do uh, exogenously, maybe from some intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then the question is, what is the impact for the defender's real payoffs? And so then we study uh, case studies here. So this we have uh, 10 targets with different urban areas. In this particular case, we assume that the non-strategic uh, attackers, they just, want to, they just want to attack New York City regardless of what. Okay. They just want New York City. Uh, so even New York City is, uh, like has been well, well, well defended, so still want to attack New York City. So in that case, if this probability is one, the prob New York City will get 100% of the resource allocation. Uh, because uh, the non-strategic uh, attackers just attack New York City, but if it's not uh, one, then we want to like kind of uh, uh, allocate the resources to different targets so that Chicago will not be that vulnerable if the attacker switch to Chicago. Then we compare three models. The, the bottom model uh, is uh, the circles is a model where the uh, defender has complete information, or complete information about the uh, about the, the attacker, which have the lowest expected damage. And then the triangles is the defenders use game theory. Okay, if the defender use game theory, it may not perform that well if the uh, the probability that attackers is non-strategic is very very high. However, if you do not use game theory, you're going to get this uh, square uh, curve. If you do not use game theory, then in vast regions you will perform very very poor because. Uh, because as long as there's some percentage 
of chance that p adversaries may use game theory, may be adaptive to your threat. So what is the insight of that? OK, suppose uh, some people uh, ask uh, intelligence, what is the probability that uh, adversaries, they are intelligent? Uh, maybe 50 50%. OK, if it's 50 50%, then using game theory is much, much more robust. Okay, because if you do not use game theory, your expected damage could be way higher than that. So this is one way to justify game theory. So in the next uh, two minutes, I'm going to just uh, share personal experience with me about the security <coughs> screening, which is, uh, so I come from China originally, and I uh, joined the University of Buffalo uh, in 2008, and I, uh, I, at that time, uh, I was uh, on a working visa, H-1B working visa, and then I come back to China to, to have my vacation, and then uh, in the December uh, uh, 2008, and then I got stuck there. And then basically the visa officer in Shanghai consulate tell me that they have to check my case. I say, okay, how long? They said maybe four weeks, maybe three, uh, six weeks, but it turns out to be like uh, more than 100 days. And actually, I think this gentleman here got like checked for like three weeks uh, as well. And three weeks is not that uh, bad compared to my experience, like more than 100 days. And then, uh, so during that time, it's actually a very stressful time for me because I have to teach. I have to teach online, so I just use the cameras to videotape myself and generate the video so that the TMA can play that in the classroom. And, but I think about, okay, why it's me? I'm not a terrorist, I'm not a spy, and I'm just a professor and doing a homeland security research. And then what is the cost of, uh, of checking me, okay? Well, there's a lot of disadvantages to my students and to my research and to the university. But what is the advantage of checking me? Okay, what if I am a spy? What if I am a bad guy or the terrorist? Then maybe they could uh, get, catch me uh, during that screening process. And then so I eventually got my visa last, uh, like uh, after 100 days. And then I read a paper during, the, during that time. I think, okay, maybe, but they're making some trade-offs, right? They're checking me. They, there's some cost of checking good guys. Right, there's sort of congestions. There are congestions. And the congestions is not good. Congestions is not good for the good guys. And then, so how to balance the congestions and the security in the presence of strategic applicants with private information? I tell, I tell, them, that I'm, I tell them that I'm not a bad guy, but I could be a bad guy from their perspectives, right? And then, uh, then how to make these trade-offs. So eventually I got this uh, uh, NSF award on this, which it turns out to be good. So we see this, uh, this again, 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 through the airport screening debates, the pat-downs, advanced image technologies, and then the uh, uh, like uh, risk-based screening. I believe this afternoon the speaker is going to talk about some more about this. And then, no, so this is good that TSA has started to think about uh, the good guys, uh, that's uh, normal travelers' uh, <coughs> behaviors, right? They talk about, think about what is the damage of uh, uh, like what is the loss in terms of good guys, the uh, value, value of times. Like uh, every day there are so many people that go through the airport security screening, but uh, every, every other, every people spend like 10 minutes there, it's a huge economic uh, damage there. And then what is a risk-based screening? And of course it depends on the risks. And then with, in this research we talk about uh, how to how to uh, balance between the screening and the security, considering not only the good guy, but also the bad guy, and also the approver, the defender's uh, uh, payoffs. This not only uh, apply to the airport screening, but also to the visa and to the borders and uh, uh, the maritime uh, transportations. And so we start building uh, like end stage models, the very complicated mathematical models, and we also study the expedited security screenings. And I think in just uh, one minute, so I will just uh, go through that. And we collect some of the data to study what is people's patience time. That's uh, how, for how long people are going to lose their patience. Uh, patients are either going to be get angry or they're going to switch to transportation mode. Uh, and then, uh, so it actually is a kind of uh, uh, exponentially distributed and the people could abandon. Yeah, we, like a couple of years ago, when the first the pat down screening was introduced, uh, we have a speaker from Washington DC who refused to fly from Washington DC to Buffalo because uh, the possibility to get pat down. So they just uh, choose to drive. And I think during that Thanksgiving, Time that the, the national traffic, uh, uh, the uh, air traffic, actually reduced by two percent. So if you uh, because lots of people they just choose to drive, but if you think, think about uh, the car accidents rates of driving, actually we probably already killed like three hundred people by that policy. Uh, anyway, 
so we st we also started to do some of the model validations and the verifications using of the real of the real data. We understand it's uh, sometimes the data is uh, not available, sometimes the data is available, but it's sensitive or classified. But we try our best to try to validate the models and develop uh, uh, like a decision support tools for the uh, stakeholders. And so, so I will be around for the rest of today, and I'm very interested to work with uh, you guys, and I'm very actively seeking. Uh, collaborations, uh, especially try to apply the academic models into reality, considering the adversary, adver adaptive adversaries, uh, congestions, and uh, like uh, uh, global uh, threats. Okay, thank you.